And there's a reason for that. Um, actually, this was originally a fragment of a violin and piano symbol that wasn't found, I think, until later. Um, his wife, Constanza, after being married later, um, happened to be going through this and found this um, kind of opus posthumous in a way, um, found publishers, and so and then people since then, musicologists, have kind of finished it out. So it's an obscure piece, one that we don't, but it's beautiful. You can play it so beautifully. One thing I want to point out right away is, you know, in the forum that we had the other day with faculty, one of the things that um, Professor Penny's raised was this idea of having a point of view and not being afraid to express it. And I feel that, Jennifer, you really found a boldness, a straightforwardness, your willingness to show your whole self and your whole psyche. And we appreciate that. There's a model performance in that way. Um, so when we think of Mozart, we often think of singers, right? He was best kind of known in his operas. And one book that I might recommend to get to know Mozart a little bit in his personalities um, is a book, Mozart's Letters, put out by Dover Edition. Maybe many of you have read it. It's a translation that Emily Anderson did. Um, but it really shows his fashion, fascination for singers. I think when he wasn't at home composing, it seemed like almost every night he was in the concert hall listening to the famous singers of the time and really in some ways obsessed with, with singing. This is where we almost see him at his strongest, obviously, in, in opera. So no, no matter if we're uh, exploring the piano sonatas or fantasy or something like this, I think we always have to treat it operatically in the vein that he may have been thinking about. Um, which I think you do. I feel like you're telling us the story. And one thing that I think also is very effective is your use of time and space and silence in the hall. Um, there's many kind of open-ended phrases and open-ended cadences that it's tempting to kind of be uncomfortable and march right over. But you really used those to kind of indicate timing and what the next color should be. That's great. It was very mature in that way, very, very trusting in that way. It's wonderful. Um, my first comment, you know, we see in, in Mozart's scores, these sort of what we call block dynamics. So in the opening, um, it's an editor's uh, parentheses, but later he uses a forte in that opening. And I think you do that very nicely, this sort of... piano for the chord, but I think actually the melodic, the material also is, is soft. It goes into this more internal, reflective, um, and then it goes back to forte. So I think we should hear this open phrase, this kind of open drama, then I think this. Give a little bit of a twinge to that. I don't think I would accent it. Sometimes if, if we're playing even softer, but linger can be more effective. So you have an E flat here, you kind of feel the again set, so we have I could do just a percent. And then the slurrish. Did you have that? That's great. So let's do the opening and see if you can give us two very different universes yeah. within that opening. with the keyboard. And it won't always be the same, right? Depending upon the instrument, the pedaling, what you just did, what the hall might be. So there's always this give and take. So maybe work a little less hard to produce and be in the moment and have this kind of collaboration <coughs> with the instrument. Try once again. Relax your shoulder. Much of 
plug in to this kind of sense of cantabile and longer line. That was lovely. Um, I'm going to be afraid, as the, the phrase ascends, maybe you can let up on the weight a little bit. So it starts with this flourish. Pressure in the finger 
so we come from this section maybe a little bit uh, before you get into this all this dance your body stuff um a little bit simpler on this descending roll i wouldn't be again too emotional just it just sends one direction down